Hi, good evening. I am Wu Wing Tai, the Vice President for Asia at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I'm, I'm in charge of the SDSN office in Kuala Lumpur. One of the key projects of SDSN Asia is the, the phasing of the appropriate way of facing the carbon dioxide challenge in Southeast Asia. The project known as the ASEAN Green Future involves nine country teams. Teams from Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Cambodia. And today, we will hear presentations from members from four of those teams. The first speaker is Professor Toby Melissa Monson from the University of Philippines. Toby, the floor is yours. You have 12 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this invitation. I thought I would talk about the potential role of blue carbon ecosystems in the Philippines carbon challenge. These thoughts follow directly from a paper we wrote last year, which argued that as a highly vulnerable country with a relatively tiny carbon footprint, the approach of the Philippines to the global decarbonization agenda should remain anchored on adaptation, which is what national climate change policy itself prescribes. In our view, climate actions that prioritize adaptation and local resilience are likely to do more at the margin for global efforts um, than disparate measures to reduce emissions per se. So these next two slides just show how the Philippines is ranked one of the most vulnerable in the world. This is the ND gain matrix, high vulnerability, low readiness. And here, um, while vulnerable, the Philippines at the same time accounts for less than half a percent of world emissions. In per capita terms, this is one third the emissions um, per capita globally. For these reasons, the country has long prioritized adaptation in its national climate change agenda, which states that climate change is to be addressed in the context of sustainable development with adaptation as the anchor strategy and mitigation as a function of adaptation to be pursued whenever applicable. This prioritization is meant to be translated to all levels of government towards an integrated ecosystem-based approach management um, system that shall ultimately render sectors climate resilient. So in our view, in my view, the country's approach to the global decarbonization agenda should be consistent with this, a position that is reinforced by the messages of the IPCC special reports, reminding us that limiting warming, even if successful, will not eliminate the urgent need to cope with impacts, which will be dire in any case. The need for adaptation cannot be overstated, therefore. However, by coherently addressing urgent local needs and building robust community ownership for climate actions, emissions or avoidance, reduction or avoidance, can be accelerated as a co-benefit. The protection and restoration of coastal blue carbon ecosystems is a possible win-win solution for the Philippines, contributing to both mitigation and adaptation while enhancing coastal livelihoods. Blue carbon refers to the organic carbon sequestered and stored over long time scales by mangrove forests, seagrasses, and salt marshes. Um, mangroves are, are the most robustly studied and are one of the uh, most carbon dense vegetated ecosystems globally. They function as a vital link between terrestrial and oceanic carbon cycles, but the value of mangrove forests goes far beyond its contribution to mitigation. They also support human communities and biodiversities. Biodiversity, which influences the livelihoods of millions. BCE um, is especially salient for the Philippines, which has the, long, the fifth longest coastline in the world and marine ecosystems that comprise anywhere between 66 and 86% of its domain. 60% of our population live in the coastal zones. About 10 million rely on small scale fishing to meet household food needs, 
70% of protein requirements of Filipinos are derived from fish. In 2018, the Philippines was the eighth largest producer of fish and the fourth largest producer of aquatic plants. The seas of the Philippines are also known for their biodiversity. Um, our reef systems are the second largest in Southeast Asia and harbor hundreds of species of coral, mangroves, and seagrasses. Mangroves uh, cover about 356,000 hectares with a recent deforestation rate of about 0.5%. Just to note, um, mangrove, mangrove loss has resulted in increases, um, estimated increases in flooding to more than 267,000 people a year between 1950 and 2010. Restoring these mangroves would bring more than $450 million per year in flood protection benefits. Um, Azanza estimates the economic contribution of marine ecosystems to be uh, uh, $967 US billion in 2007 prices. Another estimate of reef ecosystem services um, places it at about $4 billion US dollars per year. However, this productivity has been on the decline, largely as a result of the degradation of coral reefs due to siltation from deforestation, destructive fishing practices, over harvesting of mangroves, um, plastic pollution were one of the worst, among other factors. The extent to which communities will be able to adapt to climate change impacts will hinge critically on the sustained supply of ecosystem services from coastal wetlands. However, the implementation of blue carbon projects faces a number of constraints, which are increasingly well conceptualized um, into issues of fundamental science, as well as community scale and national governance. In particular, increased involvement from key stakeholders in PES, particularly commercial, the commercial sector, is maybe necessary for the success of mangrove blue carbon projects. So this begs the question, are blue carbon protection and restoration projects financially and economically viable at the local, national, regional, and global scales? Evidence is only just coming in. But um, on the local scale, Thompson 2014 asks whether uh, carbon values are sufficient to offset the opportunity costs of milkfish aquaculture the primary cause of mangrove deforestation in the Philippines. He finds that a carbon price of around five to 12 US dollars per ton, uh, uh, CO2 um, uh, uh, ton would be required on a certain uh, Panay Island. However, this excludes transaction protection costs and credit buffering for risk and so forth. So he concludes that blue carbon PES, PES can be economically viable on Panay Island provided credits are traded on compliance markets. To meet credit selling prices on the voluntary market, additional ecosystem service values would need to be incorporated, for instance, coastal protection. By the way, if rehabilitation and restore, restoration are targeted at abandoned fish ponds, of course, this metric will change. And reversion of abandoned fish ponds is currently provided by law in this country but is not enforced. Yet evidence is available that carbon storage and green belt protection was greater in abandoned ponds compared to other seafront mangrove sites, which is the favorite sites of many um, NGOs and government. Uh, Zeng just recently, uh, last year, in turn explores the global potential and limits of carbon financing for mangrove blue carbon and finds that about 20% of total mangrove areas globally are potentially investable for carbon finance projects based on the probability of imminent threat of decline or loss if left unprotected by a conservation intervention. So this is based on the additionality criterion for certifiable carbon credits under the rules of UNFCC. Of this 20%, 40%, just 40% would be financially viable over a 30 year time frame at current market rates. The Philippines was among uh, the top 13 countries with um, the highest um, net present value based on their estimates. And so Zeng concludes that a disproportionately large potential of blue carbon finance um, can be leveraged to meet national level climate mitigation goals, particularly if combined 
with other conservation interventions that further safeguard carbon stocks and biodiversity in these forests. Moving forward, healthy BCE must lie at the center of adaptation policy. However, better restoration policies are needed. Despite heavy funds for massive rehabilitation of mangrove forests in the 90s and the early 2000s, the long-term survival rates of mangroves were at 10 to 20% only. More recently, the National Greening Program um, uh, here in this country intended to grow 1.5 million hectares of forest and mangroves between 2011 and 2019. But in the first five years, 88% of it already failed. In both <coughs> cases, poor rates can be mainly traced to two factors, inappropriate species and site selection. In other words, short-term increases in area um, uh, were prioritized over long-term establishment. Reviewing uh, lessons learned, Camacho and, and, and others suggest that mangrove rehabilitation will succeed if these five uh, uh, factors are, are implemented. Um, and I highlight especially number one and two, that it is uh, beyond mere planting. And finally, if anyone wants to read it, there's a key actions also um, suggested um, to enhance blue carbon as a natural climate solution. And I think number four and five, especially for the Philippines is the most um, salient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Monsot. Uh, we will take questions at the end of all four presentations. There is a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. So please put your question on, uh, on the Q&A box and I'll read and then the participants can read it and get ready for the exciting answer that follows. Our next speaker is Mr. Lo Weissen from Sunway University, Malaysia. He'll be talking about the decarbonization of the fuel industry. Weissen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Wu. It is a great honor to be here today with uh, my fellow panelists at such a momentous event. Today, I'd like to speak a little on the fuel sector in Malaysia and um, go through a little on the state of the sector, the future, and what can be done to decarbonize a sector that is so integral to our economy. So, Malaysia, I believe, is a very privileged country. We are sheltered from natural disasters, we have no lack of basic needs, and all through history, we are full of resources that other people would fight over. From the spice trade in the colonial era to rubber and tin, all the way to the present times with palm oil and, well, oil, oil. Today, the country is the second largest produ oil producer in Southeast Asia and one of the top five largest exporters of LNG in the entire world. Exports of these fossil fuels make up a, sus a substantial bulk of revenue and economic growth despite a drop in oil prices, I believe, 2014 to 2016. Revenues from this sector contribute somewhere from around 10 to about 40% of annual government revenue. The swings are quite big because the fluctuations in oil and gas prices, particularly given you know, the volatility in the past few years, going from um, a pandemic to the current conflict, involving major exporters in uh, natural gas. Indeed, there are a lot of issues surrounding the oil and gas industry in Malaysia, and not just for us. Some of this may also be applicable to ASEAN as a region. Globally, countries have begun to gradually shift away towards uh, cleaner energy sources, moving away from especially oil and coal. Prospects for natural gas still hang kind of in the balance with some countries investing in natural gas as a low carbon alternative or for some others as a intermediate fuel source as they move towards greener energy sources. 
In local geopolitics, things are not great either, with um, so many countries bordering the South China Sea. And then within the industry itself, there is also the question of how much longer our reserves will last. Some have estimates ranging from as low as seven years. Some are a bit more <laughs> optimistic, maybe 30, 40 years um, by Petronas. Um, Petronas here is the Malaysian state-owned oil and gas company. Regardless, as with all sources of fossil fuels, there is a limit to how much there is and the clock is counting down to a time where we can no longer rely on them as an energy source. And of course, this is all before we you know, begin considering the implications of carbon emissions and climate change, along with the country's long short-term commitments. One way or another, a transition to a different energy source is coming. One of the top contenders for the fuel source of the future here is hydrogen and its product ammonia. As it stands, both these fuels are already quite common and in use within many industries. Um, in Asia, there are already initiatives in Japan and South Korea to co-combust ammonia and hydrogen in thermal plants in an effort to carbonize their power sector. Even here in Malaysia, there are already tests using ammonia and coal, coal combustion at a test rig facility here in Selangor, where I live. Outside of this, um, interest in hydrogen as a fuel source is steadily building in Malaysia. Petronas is looking to commence hydrogen projects from 2024, I believe, starting with um, blue hydrogen, that is hydrogen that's produced conventionally using natural gas with um, carbon capture and storage included. And then over time, they're looking to gradually shift towards uh, green hydrogen, which no longer relies on fossil fuels. This hopefully, along with a shift towards solar energy and other renewables, would go a long way to meet the country's target to be carbon neutral by the middle of the century. Of course, um, these are long-term targets and they are contingent on major, major overhauls in the energy, industrial and transportation sectors to accommodate these new energy sources. The biggest challenge, I think, for a new energy future here in Malaysia is in conceiving, designing and producing this infrastructure. Now, while all that is well and good, this transition will undoubtedly take time and effort. We are now less than 30 years from 2050, and the fact remains that for today, oil and gas remains one of the primary sources of energy for the region. And when it comes to the production of oil and gas, the larger contributor to climate change would be methane. And this would either be from intentional venting or, or flaring of gas or from fugitive emissions. Um, that would be leaks from infrastructure, oil rigs, pipelines, etc. In Malaysia, by our own estimates, as per our last biennial update report to the UNFCCC, over 1,000 gigagrams was released in 2060 from fugitive emissions, which accounted for nearly half of total methane emissions in the country. Most of the remaining attributed to the waste sector. And with a global warming potential of something around 86 over a 20 year period, this is equivalent to 87 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Side by side, this is over one fifth of all greenhouse gas emissions, all just from methane in fugitive emissions. Fortunately, these are shared concerns. At last year's COP26, uh, the concerns over methane emissions were brought to the forefront and Malaysia joined over a hundred countries in the global methane pledge which looks to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. In line with that, regionally, some of the key energy players have begun collaborating with um, Petronas from Malaysia, Pertamina from Indonesia, and PTT from Thailand, hosting a series of round tables to promote and share their respective practices. 
On a higher level, however, Malaysia still lags a bit behind some of our neighbours, some of which have laid out really specific targets in their NDCs and some already have policy targets domestically to, make, to mitigate methane emissions. A good starting point here then would be setting out goals and targets in line with the pledge and laying out a policy framework to achieve them. This could be as simple as adhering to the pledge that we've made or and cutting emissions by 30% or specific to the industry. This is quite possible here because as mentioned for Malaysia, there really is only two major sources of methane that is from the fuel sector and the waste sector. Um, for this, let me quickly dive deeper in the subject here. I, I do apologize. I may shoot off a few numbers here and I am aware that I do not have any slides to distract from them. So the International Energy Agency, the IEA, estimates that around 70% of abatement is possible and around 40-45% at no net cost, with the largest impact policy measure being zero routine flaring and venting. The World Bank's Global Gas Flaring Tracker estimates that over 2 billion cubic meters of gas was flared in 2021 just in Malaysian oil fields. Let me take a step back. Um, during oil production, so natural gas is often produced from the reservoir along with oil. Oftentimes there is too much gas coming up as well. So what operators do is that they flare or burn off the excess gas to reduce the pressure in the equipment. If combustion is not complete or in some cases, operators may choose to burn off the gas, not to burn off the gas, then methane is directly vented into the atmosphere. Flaring is basically been going on since we started the mass production of oil. And this brings us to the question of why. Natural gas is after all uh, another valuable commodity. Why don't countries uh, and companies capture and sell the gas? That's 2 billion cubic meters from Malaysian fields and I believe 144 billion cubic meters globally more than enough to cover the gas needs of a few smaller countries. As always, a big part of the question is economics. Oil fields are remote and methane from there is either inconsistent or too small or just a combination of that. It's challenging to, to, to transport this gas to the proper plants. In the current age, I believe a uh, change of mindset is needed and one that we are hopefully heading towards. Knowing that the price of inaction and the cost, not just monetary, but to the health and well being of people and planet, this can and this must shift the cost benefit analysis. And to the credit here, Petronas has pledged to avoid you know, routine flaring in new oil fields and to end routine flaring in existing oil production sites by 2030. With stronger regulations and policies, perhaps we will soon see an end to flaring in the near future. I think I will stop here and conclude my segment. In the longer term, the transition in Malaysia away from oil and gas is indeed on the horizon. This gap can potentially be filled with a combination of hydrogen-based fuels and renewable energies. Solar and hydro are abundant here in our tropical paradise. In the meantime, Malaysia should look to reduce our methane emissions, especially given its large short-term impact on the climate. There is here a big potential to curb much of this at little to no cost, and we could be a leading example in the region and beyond. Thank you very much. Uh, professor, your, your music. Thank you, Wyson, for the excellent presentation. I, I, our next, for people who have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our next speaker is Professor Chia Waiman from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Waiman, you have 12 minutes. Thank you, Prof Wu. I would actually uh, like to share my screen. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, very clearly. Thank, thank, 
Th thank you, Prof. Wu. I'm Wai Meng from Nanyang Technological University. Today, my team and I, we have put together some slide summarizing updates and issues related to carbon challenges uh, in Singapore. So let me share with you some background information about Singapore. Singapore is actually a small, low-lying -ly island city state of about 718 kilometer, uh, square kilometer, high population density of about 7,500 people per square kilometer, one of the highest density in the world. And we are an export-oriented and open economy. We receive a lot of rainfall, but water, is scared because of limited land to collect and store rainwater. And because of our geographical positions along East West trade routes, make it natural locations for oil storage and refinery. Now, then let's uh, see in terms of our economic structure. So we are doing pretty well after the pandemic. We have real GDP growth of 7.6% in 2021. Income per capita in Singapore is one of the highest in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. Manufacturing sector is one of the key sector contributing to 22.3% of uh, uh, our nominal GDP. Now, climate change basically poses an existential challenges to Singapore when sea level were to increase by one meter we would expect to see loss of land value from floating estimated to be about US dollar $2 billion. For CO2 emissions, this is uh, uh, CO2 emissions, in fact, is the most significant emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So 95%, close to 95% of greenhouse gas emissions come from CO2 and concentrated in power manufacturing and the transport sector. So CO2 emissions are basically comparable to developing uh, developed Asian economies like uh, Korea and Japan. So uh, the one in red is highlighted is actually about Singapore. So you can actually see that we are comparable to Japan and uh, Korea. But in terms of per capita emissions, we didn't do as well. Uh, we are being ranked out of 159 countries in the world. We are being ranked 133 in terms of per capita emissions. So bulk of our energy consumptions by sector basically come from industrial and commerce and services sector for industry related sector. So again, manufacturing becomes the key uh, sector that have uh, that consume most of the energy. Now, for the household consumptions, you can actually see that energy consumptions profile of a typical household. We spend a lot on air conditioner, 36%, 21% on water heater. And for household electricity consumptions by dwelling types, you can see that private apartments and condominiums actually tends to consume a lot more energy compared to others. Now, what are the challenges associated with achieving carbon abatement objectives in Singapore? UNFCC Article 4.8 and Article 4.10 are particularly relevant to Singapore. In Article 4.8, Singapore is a small island country. Singapore is a country with low-lying coastal area, and it is also a country that highly depends on income generated from productions and exports and consumptions of fossil fuel and associated energy intensive products. Beside Article 4.10 also state that the party shall in accordance with Article 10 take into considerations in the implementations of the commitments of the conventions, the situations of the party, particularly developing countries party with economies that are vulnerable to the adverse effects of the implementations of measure to respond to climate change. Now, then harnessing alternative energy sources is a major uh, challenge in Singapore. Take, for example, biomass. We already convert much of our waste to energy, uh, providing about 2.5% of the total electricity. Geothermal energy we cannot redo really that because of small land area. Hydroelectricity, Singapore is generally flat with no major river system. Tidal 
and wave power, the tidal range is about 1.7 meter, which is well below the four uh, meter uh, range required to generate power. Nuclear energy is not really an option at the moment. The reasons is because the risk tends to be very high, uh, given that we are a small and a highly density, uh, a highly uh, 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 high density uh, populated city. So the risk can actually outweigh the benefit at this point. For wind energy, we say this is also not a viable option because the wind speed is actually uh, much lower than what is required. And the only options that left behind for Singapore is probably the solar PV. Now, what is Singapore commitments to net zero given all the restrictions and constraints we face? So in 2005, we have uh, our emissions intensity is about 0.176 kilogram CO2 equivalents per uh, GDP generated. But in 2030, we decide uh, to reduce this by 36%, drop to 0 0.113 kg. By 2050, we would like to halve these emissions. And back then, we say we do not really have uh, net zero emissions, uh, but we net zero emissions to us the targets will be as soon as viable uh, in the second half of the century. But then in straight time news on 6 September 2022, which is about two weeks ago, NCCS of Singapore is deciding whether to raise our 2030 climate target to support the longer term goal. To do that, they actually seek public opinions public can give their view on the 2050 timeline and the possibility of an update 2030 targets while a government's feedback portal. So the exercise will close next Monday. So from there, then we can actually see whether setting 2050 as our target is feasible. If so, then setting 2050 to achieve net zero emissions will align Singapore longer term climate target with other developed countries. Now, in terms of our commitment, Singapore government is actually an early mover on national carbon emissions reductions efforts. The first Singapore Green Plan was formulated in 1992, followed by the second one in 2002, and the current one in 2020, which is called the Green, Singapore Green Plan 2030. Singapore is also the first 30 countries to ratify the Paris Agreements in September 2016, among the first 20 countries to enhance 2030 NDC and also the LEDS. And it is also the first Southeast Asia country to announce a carbon tax in 2017. So most of the efforts of uh, 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 contributions to carbon carbon abatements is actually coming from the government sector and I showed you why. So Singapore is facing the energy trilemma of sustainability, security and affordability. So energy basically is a strategic resource for Singapore because the country is completely reliant on the imports of oil and gas for the energy needs. No subsidy on energy costs. Basically in Singapore, we believe that pricing energy correctly is important to incentivize firms and households to use energy carefully. And switching to cleaner energy, since 2000s, Singapore has taken steps to use a clean fuel mix for electricity generations, switch, switching from fuel oil to natural gas. We have four switches that are going that we are going to harness to achieve a future with clean and efficient uh, energy. So Singapore is looking into these four switches. So during the transitions, natural gas, where we are going to switch from fuel oil to natural gas. So you can see by 2020, 95% of the electricity is generated from natural gas, solar. Singapore most promising renewable energy source. Regional power grids, 
Singapore will actually tap on regional power grids through bilateral cooperations. And we are also going to look into and explore into solutions that have potential to reduce Singapore carbon footprint. So let's take a look of natural gas in Singapore as a dominant fuel in generating electricity. You can actually see the one uh, uh, that uh, highlighted shows that 95% of our electricity is actually coming from natural gas. Industry-related sector consume close to 90% of natural gas, manufacturings in particular. So industry-related consuming up to 89% of the natural gas manufacturing itself uh, is consuming up to 99.5%. Now, the number of solar PV in Singapore is increasing. So most of it is actually coming from the town council and grassroots. But we can actually see there's increased installations of solar PV capacity by the private sector. Now, this is actually a very nice picture to show how Singapore is actually making use of its uh, reservoir where they, the country have the world largest floating solar farm and they are building more, right? So you can actually see all other reservoirs going to have similar types of solar farms at the water bodies. Now, Singapore is stepping on regional power grids to uh, acquire cleaner energy. So the Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore power integrations projects has already been signed. And this allows import up to 100 megawatts of renewable hydropower from Laos to Singapore, while Thailand and Malaysia using the existing, existing interconnections that uh, uh, we have already established. And we started this in June 2022. Now, Singapore has identified some promising low carbon renewable energy desalinations plant. So we opened the fifth plant in Jurong Island. This is as big as 3.7 hectare, uh, highly automated, require only three men to run the show, can produce up to 30 million gallons, uh, which is 7% of Singapore daily water demands. 5% more energy efficiency. Now, the next thing is we are going to have our first hydrogen ready power plants ready by 2026. Hydrogens can be obtained in many ways and can be used as fuel, produce water later on as a byproduct. Now, Singapore does have transformative plans for change. So, for example, Singapore have intentions to plant 1 million trees across the island, deploy floating solar PV on reservoir, which you have seen, import green energy from Laos, ban diesel cars and taxi from 2025 onwards, phase out all internal combustion engine vehicle by 2040, adopt technology and circular measure. And this is important and I showed you why. And launch a towards zero waste plan and we introduce carbon tax. So for carbon tax in Singapore right now is relatively low. It is about $5, but we plan to raise it to $25 in 2024, 45 in 2026. And thereafter in 2030, we would expect carbon tax of 50 to $80. Now, then for petrol car, they are still dominating the car populations in Singapore, but by 2040, you will see no such car on the road in Singapore. Then uh, private companies are doing their share as well. Now, then how did Singapore, uh, how uh, does Singapore rank in terms of our net zero readiness? Uh, index. This is an index developed by KPMG in 2021. Singapore is ranked 15. Uh, the other countries uh, included in the ranking from Southeast Asia would be Japan's rank 7, South Korea rank 11, and China is currently ranked uh, 20. So how has Singapore done so far in environmental performance? So we are ranked 44, first in ASEAN. But after doing all this, 
the climate actions tracker still classifies Singapore targets as uh, as critically insufficient. So what does that mean? That means if all countries were to follow Singapore pathway, we would expect the temperature to increase by four degrees Celsius. So, but however, this uh, climate actions tracker does not fully take into consideration Singapore unique characteristics of high population density and geographical constraint. We face challenges for renewable energy generations. We have a significant manufacturing sector, a hub for shipping, aviation, and tourism. And oil and gas refining is actually an important sector in Singapore. So what are the ways forwards? So the ways forwards is that we hope to have a circular economy approach in our efforts towards uh, net zero. If we were to look at Singapore example, the best example to refer to is what we call new water in Singapore. It is a success story that we are able to make use of wastewater uh, and then reclaim this water into ultra clean high grade water that help to cushion Singapore water supply against dry weather. And this water is basically used for industrial and air cooling purposes. And it is uh, the biggest user uh, of the new water, uh, wafer fabrications plants. And to produce this new water, they have to go through three very uh, rigorous uh, process, including microfiltrations, reverse osmosis, ultra wireless uh, disinfections. So, this new water shows Singapore ability to close the water loop by recycling water endlessly. So if we can do this for water, can we do this for waste and resource management? So the recycling rates in Singapore is flat for more than 20. To wind up. Okay, so uh, we have very uh, low recycling rates of 20%, right? But then, what we now aim to do is, is it possible for us to do something similar to uh, waste and resource management, uh, like what we do in new water, creating some things that we call new sand from the incinerations of ash for construction's purpose and closing the waste loops. Now, this is probably the uh, key things that I like to share with you. Singapore now, even though um, uh, they are doing pretty fine, but the young people, even though they are aware of the um, almost all the environmental issues, but the adoptions and advocacy is actually very, very low, right? So what would be the key takeaway? So we say despite all constraint and unique circumstances, Singapore is actually committed to reducing emissions across all sectors to support global, uh, global climate actions. But there is significant trade-off between energy security and going green. There's also trade-off between economic competitiveness and going green. But we still need to identify optimal carbon tax and how we can reduce, redistribute revenue back to the uh, sectors. Then the last things would be, we probably need to shape the mindset and commitments of the young Singaporeans, because now you can actually see most efforts is actually coming from the governments. So how about private individual? So the young Singaporeans, they are not acting uh, in the interest of environment. So we need to educate them because 29% of the average Singaporeans diet still consists of poultry, eggs and seafoods. Meat products uh, uh, usually have significantly higher uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this probably would be the things that the Singapore governments need to do to educate the general publics of Singapore. So with that, I stop my presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chia. Our Fourth speaker is Mr. Gwenarif Chang uh, from Cambodia. Uh, Dr. Chang, uh, you have 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu Wing. Uh, and 
uh, they are distinguished panelists and would like to appreciate what you have stated in your presentation, which helped me to formulate a, a more comprehensive approach with uh, regards to uh, energy transitions, uh, circular economy, and towards sustainable developments uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, as I mean, all the three presenters mentioned from uh, uh, rehabilitation of mangrove forests in the Philippines to um, kind of uh, 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 energy transition in Malaysia to a very comprehensive circular economy approach to what net zero in Singapore. Um, the Southeast Asian region uh, uh, is uh, a kind of a experimenting ground, so to speak, when it comes to uh, energy transition and circular economy. Uh, this year, as uh, Cambodia, as a chair of ASEAN, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen has proposed uh, grafting ASEAN Green Deal. Well, we don't have the concept note yet. Uh, I think uh, Cambodian chair is still a developing concept note on ASEAN Green Deal. But uh, this was in, very much inspired by the EU Green Deal, uh, inspired by the works of uh, the Sustainable Development Networks, uh, which Professor Wu Wing also one part of the, this network, uh, chaired by Professor Jeffrey Shark. So that that is the, the, the new momentum across Southeast Asia uh, when it comes to ASEAN Green Deal. So what uh, would be the kind of key elements of ASEAN Green Deal? Uh, uh, we can guess perhaps uh, with regards to this new development in the region is, of course, energy transition will be one of the key elements. And uh, lately uh, at the ASEAN Energy Minister meeting, uh, East Asian uh, Energy Minister meeting and ASEAN Plus Three Energy Minister, there's a renewed political commitment uh, with regards to uh, uh, energy transition. So how to accelerate this energy transition toward uh, green and renew renewable energy. And as you uh, may all know that the landscape of energy in Southeast Asia still very much relies on fossil fuel, uh, which uh, affects the uh, climate change. And we need to do something uh, as political leaders have promised uh, in order to realize carbon neutrality either by 2030 and 2050 targets. So that is a kind of political commitment uh, at, at region, regional level when it comes to energy transition. Of course, the uh, Prime Minister also uh, mentioned, Hun Sen also mentioned about uh, the development of special green economic zone. So that again is a, a new initiative across Southeast Asia, uh, a special green economic zone and uh, still the work in progress and ASEAN Economic Club, which was launched uh, on the 12th September this month, uh, have been tasked to develop this concept of ASEAN Green Deal and special green economic zone with the support of the uh, experts uh, from the ASEAN Economic Club and UNSCAP uh, working together uh, to develop these, all these concepts. And uh, remarkably, uh, Cambodia also tried to promote ESG especially at the parliamentary uh, dialogue, uh, ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, which will take place uh, November this year. So ESG uh, investment and uh, policy dialogue and consultation on ESG is uh, relatively new uh, across Southeast Asia, but at least it is a new momentum uh, when it comes to ESG. And at least uh, uh, Cambodia as a chair of ASEAN have uh, have strong interest in promoting the dialogue on this at the uh, parliamentary uh, dialogue level. So that is uh, some of the new developments uh, uh, with regards to the Cambodian contribution as a child ASEAN to uh, uh, sustainable development in Southeast Asia. Now, looking at the role of social innovation. Again, social innovation uh, is not yet, has not yet been uh, integrated uh, or streamlined into sustainable development goals. But uh, there's uh, several practices uh, taking place already in the region with uh, involved social innovation and sustainable developments. So some may ask, uh, what does it mean, social innovations? Well, we, we don't have a clear kind of standard, unified standard on social innovation, but uh, the general understanding of social innovation are the development of new solutions. Either it's a product, services, model, market, or processes. It's a novel solution that can simultaneously uh, meet the uh, social need 
uh, and lead to a new or improved capabilities and relationship or better use of assets and resources. So this is um, uh, the, the new kind of uh, uh, momentum that we need to push when it comes to uh, social innovation for sustainable development or as in Green Deal. How can we develop novel solutions uh, in order to uh, meet the social need? So it's not, so in order to deal with the um, uh, energy transition, for instance, it does not need only technical innovation, but it also need social innovation. And our presenter also mentioned about the importance of indigenous knowledge when it comes to the mangrove uh, reforestations, uh, the importance of the, the behavior change when it comes to sustainable ball living uh, in the case of Singapore. And uh, we, we need to do more when it comes to social behavior change. Uh, how can we uh, have this kind of social transformation that can lead to uh, the realization of sustainable development goals? So, so social innovation also involved in this, this kind of systematic change. Uh, systematic change involved the interaction of many elements, right? Uh, social movement, business model, law and regulation, uh, infrastructure and data, and kind of the development of entirely new ways of thinking and doing. So this is kind of paradigm shift in terms of thinking, also doing uh, at the social level, uh, business level, uh, government level. Uh, also uh, the uh, infrastructure development level. So these are something that we need to kind of uh, contemplate uh, when it comes to the uh, realization of SDG and uh, sustainable uh, kind of business and uh, uh, ASEAN uh, new Green Deal uh, by having, creating this kind of also social movement and uh, the promoting green business models. So. So this is a, a kind of systematic change that social innovation play uh, a critical role in this process. Um, for instance, I just would like to uh, have a case of uh, nature-based solutions that is, this is a great potential. Uh, the mangrove forest can be part of these nature-based solutions. And there's many examples across uh, Southeast Asia, which nature uh, based solution have been uh, implemented, uh, but the scaling of this nature based solution uh, remain small. So we need to scale up uh, the impact of nature based solution because uh, even though uh, Southeast Asia only cover 3% of the Earth's planets, uh, the surface of the planet's Earth, but it is uh, a host to about 20% of world plants, animal, and marine species. So that is the have great potential for Southeast Asia to provide a nature-based solutions to uh, uh, deal with uh, climate change, for instance. So now specifically on energy transitions. Uh, so energy transitions, uh, we talk a lot on this, uh, I mean, the presentations this morning, which uh, uh, relies on uh, this kind of policy framework design, uh, rely on technological innovation, but the, the missing point here is social innovation, which I, I, I introduced earlier. Why does it matter, social innovations? So for instance, uh, in the energy transition, uh, we need to promote social innovation that can contribute to a low carbon energy transition. We need to uh, empower this kind of civic engagement uh, and uh, social goals that uh, pertain to the general well-being of community. So we need this kind of civic engagements and behavior change at a social level when it comes to energy transition to uh, uh, clean and renewable energy. And this kind of social change, uh, social movement also create put a pressure on the policy makers when it comes to uh, green energy transition as well. So um, when it comes to uh, uh, this kind of uh, social innovation in uh, energy transition, uh, there are some kind of uh, uh, benefits of promoting social innovation because social innovation uh, can promote this kind of social incentive, including green nudges uh, that can stimulate behavior change uh, in order to lower energy consumptions at the household level or at the uh, company or, or uh, institutional level. And then social innovation also have created this kind of a counter-cultural and self-consciously norm uh, by social groups in uh, 
respond to unsustainable regimes. So that again, it's about a cultural change too. Uh, so can how can we uh, develop this uh, counter-cultural uh, movement or, or mindset against the unsus unsustainable regimes across Southeast Asia? And also social innovation can have foster change toward a uh, more inclusive and uh, sustainable society. Uh, so, so that is something that uh, we can work together uh, in order to promote a more inclusive and sustainable so society in, across Southeast Asia through uh, social innovations. Um, of course, social innovation also have uh, formed this kind of new social configurations. So new social con configuration can include uh, social entrepreneurs uh, that uh, can build a social network supportive of uh, re renewable energy. So perhaps we, we can have this kind of uh, social entrepreneur uh, network across Southeast Asia that is uh, kind of pro-renewable energy. So that is a new configuration uh, when it comes to uh, the social uh, innovations in, in the regions. And of course, social innovation also lead to new organizational forms, uh, such as the uh, creation of renewable energy cooperatives, for instance. So this is um, uh, a new, uh, perhaps, uh, potential dynamics. How can we form a renewable energy cooperatives uh, across uh, Southeast Asia? So to conclude my presentation here, uh, social innovation matters and play critical role in sustainable development goal. And we need to uh, promote more dialogue on social innovation, which is the uh, development of novel solution, uh, taking into consideration social needs and the social well-being into consideration in implementing uh, sustainable development across Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for emphasizing the importance of social innovation in, in order to reduce uh, C the CO2 problem more effectively. Now, uh, we have had a total of four questions of which one of them has been answered by Professor Monson. Well, let us have uh, all four speakers turn on their videos and uh, you will take the questions as I'll ask each of you the questions. The first question is how does ASEAN lobby for climate justice and loss and damage? And the second question I have, I think is, uh, well, it is more general. Uh, what is the status of handling food waste from small and medium uh, food waste producers? Things like a hawker center, shopping malls. So uh, we would, the, the, quest, the, the question is about how much of it is being done in Singapore. Then there's a question from Megan Snellings to Chia Wai Man, which is that she's amazed to learn of floating solar panels. And she wonders if there are any negative impact to the sea life. And the other question that is asked is, uh, can you say more about the carbon tax? Uh, is, is it the same across industries? for example. So let's start with Toby. Would you like to uh, take the mangrove question? That was asked uh, earlier. Or, or, or answer any one of the ones that have just been said. Yeah, there was um, um, a question on, is this what you're talking about? If there were any, if there are any carbon projects? Um, I answered that. Carbon deals involving mangrove restoration. Yes. I. I I wrote an answer and I basically said, I think in this in the Philippines, I, I believe there's a pilot project in one municipality with a Japanese company. I came across it and I'll try to find it. Yeah. Um, in general, however, this hasn't, I mean, it's only now beginning because uh, how to treat blue carbon, you know, is, is only becoming clearer now. And um, and so there's an article by um, McCready um, and others who outline precisely the challenges of operationalizing a market marketable blue carbon and the ways forward. Um, and, and so I put the link um, in the chat box. So I think we're all, we all know that there is potential, but you know, 
the devil is in the details. And that is what um, uh, everyone's trying to uh, figure out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, why, why man? Thank you, Prof Wu. So I probably would take uh, Megan uh, questions on the floating solar panel. So as of now, the, the solar panel, we see it uh, being constructed on the water reservoir. So it's not so much uh, that uh, that that's the reasons why we have less concern mm -hmm. on the sea life surrounding the panel. And uh, regarding the uh, carbon tax, uh, of course, we probably would say that the $5 carbon tax that uh, they actually impose on, on uh, industrial, commercial manufacturers or even household tends to be uh, way too low. Uh, you probably can see earlier on from the chart that is actually uh, uh, one of the lowest uh, in the world, but we are going to increase that. Now, uh, maybe I give you an example. For example, if I'm paying for my electricity bills of $120 Singapore dollars per month, then I can actually see that carbon tax is probably about $1. So that is not going to change my behavior towards uh, consuming uh, energies, right? So the appropriate carbon tax level should be the one that uh, would allow companies and household to internalize the cost of carbon emissions, right? So I think uh, that probably will be something that we uh, need to uh, work towards. Thank you. Uh, there's a question of lobbying for climate justice and for compensation of loss and damage from climate change. And do you, any of you know um, efforts in this, on, on this issue? Well, uh, I, I would say that uh, climate justice, uh, it's not yet at the policymaker level. It's mainly at the civil societies, uh, kind of this kind of dialogue. And uh, it have a certain uh, political implication when it comes to climate justice. So uh, I think next step to promote this is to perhaps have a multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue, especially between civil society and the private sector and the government, uh, to, to, to have the same understanding what constitutes climate justice and what are the rule and regulations and a business model that can uh, respond to uh, climate justice. Yeah, thank you. Well, that is a question of how prepared are the ASEAN workforce for the green economy? Any response from you? I have to uh, say that the idea of having floating uh, solar panel is certainly a very cute and clever idea, but I presume it would work best only in countries that do not experience typhoons. Otherwise, uh, that, 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 that cannot be done. But yes, since we have now gone past the hour, and uh, I would like to thank the speakers and the audience for their participation and uh, feel free to send emails to the four speakers to follow up on specific questions. Thank you very much, Professor Monson, Professor Chia, Mr. Lo, and Dr. Chia. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.